good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sunday and welcome from your break from the film Good Hair, the third film in our 2021 African American film series. I'll be your moderator today. My name is Dr. Karen Krieger. I'm a professor in the Department of Family and Geriatric Medicine at the University of Louisville School of Medicine, Director of Health Equity of the Health Sciences Center and Endowed Chair in Urban Policy for the Foundation of Healthy Kentucky at the University of Louisville. This series is in its third year. It's a collaborative venture between the Office of Diversity and Inclusion Health Sciences Center, University of Louisville, the Louisville Free Public Library, and the Mayor's Program Lean Into Louisville. I'd like to thank our host, Paul Burns from the Louisville Free Public Library for making the series happen each Sunday afternoon in February. Normally, we conduct this film series in the main branch of the Louisville Free Public Library with panel discussions following a 2 p.m. airing of the film. This year, the panels will start after the ending of the film with a 2 p.m. Sunday streaming start time. Our panel is starting at 3.45 and it's going to end at approximately 4.40 today. At 4.25, I'm going to introduce an animated short film called Hair Love, which was the 2020 Academy Award winner for short animated films. This film is seven minutes long and I apologize for any inconvenience since we would have normally ended this at 4.30. Please, don't be shy about submitting your questions and comments on the Facebook chat or on the tech support email, which will be communicated to our panel. As always, we value your opinions about our production. So please complete the survey that's emailed to you after each film event, the day after the film. Our film this week was Good Hair. It's a documentary that was written, produced, and starred in by Chris Rock. After our film, which you've seen, I'm going to be introducing each of our panelists in turn. After I've made all these introductions, the panelists will have five to 10 minutes to give their impressions of the film before we entertain your questions and comments. At 425, we'll air the seven minute short animated film, Hair Love. I'm going to start my introductions with Professor Alita Poe. Professor Poe received her BS in chemistry from the University of South Alabama in Mississippi and in her, sorry, she received her master's in science and toxicology and her PhD in analytical chemistry from American University in Washington DC in 2002. After receiving her doctorate in analytical chemistry, Dr. Poe spent two years at Louisiana State University before being recruited to come to the University of Louisville Department of Chemistry in the College of Arts and Sciences in 2005. While at UofL, Dr. Poe has been the principal investigator on the federal grant research experiences for undergrads, the first of its kind in the chemistry department at UofL. Dr. Poe serves as the chemistry department safety coordinator and she teaches classes on both the graduate and undergraduate level in the department of chemistry, routinely teaching the general chemistry lecture and lab courses at UofL. And for those that you don't know, chemistry is one of the pathways for professional um, degrees in both medicine, dentistry, and pharmacy. She has also served as a university faculty senator, served on the Commission of Diversity and Racial Equality, and on the College of Arts and Sciences Diversity Council. At the University of Louisville, Dr. Poe uses mass spectrometry to conduct research on carbohydrate polymers in the vitreous of the eye. She supervises both graduate and undergraduate students on their research projects and has taught general chemistry lecture and lab courses in this country and internationally. She teaches a graduate level advanced analytical chemistry course in a team teaching environment. And because she's interested in the success of her students, she's active with the University of Louisville's Delphi Center for online teaching and learning. For professional development, she attends numerous month long faculty circles to discuss the best practices for student learning and has served on panels at the university to offer advice for strategies to teach large enrollment classes. And if you've not taken classes and general chemistry before, they tend to be somewhere around 100 kids in the class. She's been nominated as a faculty favorite and is the most influential faculty member by high achieving student athletes. Currently, she's an associate professor in chemistry at UofL in the College of Arts and Sciences. She's married to Dwayne Sorrell and they've got a dog, Buster. Our second panelist today is Dr. Dorica Canada Cunningham. She's a licensed psychologist and multicultural specialist. She received her BA from the University of Louisville in psychology, 
her Master's of Education at the University of Louisville in Counseling Psychology and a PhD in Boston College in Counseling Psychology. Dr. Canada is a licensed psychologist in the state of Massachusetts with 10 plus years of clinical training and practice. She has a diverse clinical, uh, professional and clinical background, including providing psychotherapy, community outreach, assessment and consultation for universities and schools across the state of Massachusetts. She's currently a staff psychologist and the multicultural specialist for counseling and health services at Salem State University. And she's also a visiting assistant professor for the psychology department and has served as an appointed member for the president's advisory committee on diversity and inclusive excellence at Salem State University. She enjoys working with adolescents, young adults, particularly with things around race, culture, identity, and spirituality. She engages in her work from an empowerment and social justice perspective, and she's passionate about honoring and exemplifying the voices of communities of color in the field of psychology. Our third panelist, but not our least, we have Professor Wendy Green, a trailblazing US anti-discrimination law scholar, teacher, and advocate who's devoted her professional life's work to advancing racial, color, and gender equity in workplaces and beyond. Professor Green's legal scholarship and public advocacy, which illuminate how constructions of identity inform and constrain anti-discrimination law, have generated civil rights protections for victims of discrimination throughout the United States. A visionary, she's the architect of two legal constructs recognized within anti-discrimination law theory and praxis, misperception discrimination and grooming codes discrimination. Through her award-winning publications and activism in these areas, Professor Green crafted a legal blueprint for historic civil rights legislation known as the Crown Acts, creating a respectful world for natural hair acts, while also shaping the enforcement stance of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, federal courts, administrative law, judges, and civil and human rights organizations in groundbreaking work. Professor Green is the first tenured African-American on the Drexel University Thomas R. Klein School of Law faculty. Prior to joining the Drexel Law faculty, she was a faculty member at Sanford University's Cumberland School of Law in Birmingham, Alabama from 2007 to 2012, where she was one of the youngest women of color to earn tenure and full professorship. Since entering the Legal Academy, Professor Green has garnered national and institutional awards for excellence in scholarship and teaching. And recently, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute paid homage to Professor Green's scholarly activism by selecting her to present the Institute's highest honor, the Fred L. Shuttleworth Human Rights Award to civil rights icon, Dr. Angela Y. Davis on June 10th, 2020. She's a globetrotter and has delivered over 100 presentations throughout the United States in four continents while regularly providing commentary to media outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Business Insider, and Bloomberg News. She's also one of the few U.S. legal academics engaged in the study of comparative slavery and race relations law in the Americas and Caribbean areas. She's delivered several keynote addresses. In light of Professor Green's vast expertise on anti-discrimination law and policy at the intersection of race, color, gender, and religion, these highly sought after consultants for nonprofit organizations, institutional organizations for education, professional associations, human rights agencies, and corporations on matters and programming related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. A native of Columbia, South Carolina, she's a graduate of Xavier University in Louisiana. BA with honors in English and a double minor in African American Studies and Spanish. She received her law degree at Tulane University School of Law and the George Washington University School of Law. There we have them. We have all of our panelists and they're still with me. They were such accomplished women. It took me a minute to get all that through. We'll start with Dr. Poe. Dr. Poe, can you give me your impressions of this film, Good Hair? So thinking about my background, when I first left the movie, I was a little bit disappointed and a little sad because I wished more time had been spent on talking about the dangers of the chemical that is used to actually relax our hair. But then after I kind of jumped out of my specialty and realized, okay, 
uh, Chris was trying to trying to get to a whole group of people, a larger swath of people. And not everyone is gonna be just interested in the chemistry. He wanted to make a movie that both educated and entertained people. And I, part of me feels like I believe it was marketed, not necessarily correctly. It was sort of marketed like a comedy. And I, I don't think that, I, I don't think it got the proper presentation so that it could get the wider viewing that it that it should have gotten. So then after I you know jumped out of my specialty and sat back and thought about as a black woman, I think that the movie was really well done. I think that he wanted to educate and he also wanted to inform and then have a little bit of entertainment also. And I think that the movie did all three of those things quite well. In the first few minutes, he did the education. I mean, like it was before 12 minutes of the movie, you know, before the 12 minute mark of the movie, he was already talking about the, the chemistry of what's happening to the hair. And, you know, he talked about the, the active ingredient sodium hydroxide that is put in these relaxers. And he even had a guy to come and show what happens if you put it on raw chicken skin, which is a, a decent representation of human skin. And then, you know, he showed some an interaction with sodium hydroxide and some metals also over periods of time. Um, I think that he really wanted to educate. He wanted to make women, people, particularly women, because we're the ones who are doing this to our hair, to ask questions why. Why do we do this? And then after the educational part of the movie, he wanted us to think about, you know, is, is it worth it? After going, you know, after learning what this does to your hair and possibly your scalp, is it, is it really worth, you know, what, what we're doing? Um, and I, I think he, he kind of did that. He kind of left people asking, why do we do this? Do we really need to do this? Maybe priorities need to change. If so, you know, how do we even live in a society that kind of will allow that over time? I, I, think, I think he left us really asking these types of questions and trying to be introspective of why do we do this to our hair? So I think it was well done. Thank you. Dr. Cunningham, I've put together a panel of all kinds of specialties to approach this film from different perspectives. I'm really interested in knowing how you felt about this film. Yes, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Um, I love how Dr. Poe, I could hear your chemistry science kind of lens. Um, and guess what? I do the same thing. I have the psychology lens. So, um, you know, my first impressions, what's interesting is that I've watched this film before, you know, when it first was released. Um, it was very interesting for me to even just think about the context of time, of kind of where things are now compared to when this film was released. I believe it was released in 2009, so over, you know, a decade ago. Um, but similar to what Dr. Poe said, I think um, I did love the fact that Chris Rock, this very hilarious person who can bring humor to almost any topic, um, kind of in the in a comedic kind of way, like you mentioned, Dr. Poe, um, brought this this conversation um, to the forefront, one that I think was very needed at the time that the film was created, um, but also one that I think is really important. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is a conversation we've had, I think, in the Black community um, kind of across time. But I think when I think back to 2009, at least for myself, it felt like a very relevant conversation. Um, and it is interesting to think about, again, the, the context of time. I would say most people or some people um, who would consider the, the more recent natural hair movement to have happened actually not long after that time period, around the kind of 2010 um, period is kind of when it kind of took off a little bit more. And so I'm not saying the film necessarily ignited that movement, but it is interesting to think about um, kind of the positionality of the film in that movement and kind of maybe in some way, some conversations folks were having in their households with their friends because of the film. Um, you know, in watching it, it just really reminded me again with the psychology perspective of just how complex the experience of black women's hair 
is there's a science like Dr. Poe said to it, um, but there's also an art to it. You know, when you saw these women um, at these hair shows, you know, in the South, um, the way they displayed it, the amount of energy and effort that one puts into making sure that it looks a certain kind of way. Um, it's personal, it's political, it's psychological, it's cultural. Um, and I think the film just captured kind of that essence, the complexity of it. Um, it also just captured the deep rooted kind of ways that our um, thoughts, our behaviors, our attitudes are really influenced um, by how we've been socialized, right? The way that we think about our hair, um, all of those things associated with hair, we've been socialized. Um, and there is a way in which many of us can remember, um, and it was kind of stated in a film, I think Mia Long mentioned it, the pressures, the messages that you've received either directly or indirectly from a lot of people in a lot of contexts, whether that be your family, your friends, peers, um, the media, beauty industry, right? Um, political systems, educational systems. We've heard stories about young kids being told to go home because they had a certain hairstyle. Um, so, so many messages that we receive. Um, and I think unfortunately, as it was kind of displayed in the film, a lot of it, it can be internalized. Um, and there is a way in which when I think about my own process of my relationship with my hair, um, a lot of us have to unlearn and relearn how to relate to our hair um, and learn new ways of caring for and loving our hair. And so again, as I was watching the film and knowing myself in 2021 versus myself in 2009 when I first watched it, just thinking of my own hair journey and the, uh, the journey of other kind of fellow Black women as well, um, it was just really interesting uh, to consider. So I'm very interested to kind of continue this conversation today. But those were kind of my first impressions. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Wendy Green has a website, Free the Hair. That's a movement. And your specialty is dealing with employment discrimination issues based on hair. Um, both of my adult children have had natural hairstyles now for over 20 years. And yeah, I'm really glad you're here with us. Tell me your impressions here. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me and, and being a part of this really important conversation. I'll have to tell you, because I have been studying and writing about this issue and publishing articles on um, natural hair discrimination in particular and the kinds of stigmas that are associated with um, our natural hair textures and hairstyles for, over, for wow, almost 15 years now. Of course, I came in there look, reading, uh, or not reading, but watching it through that lens. And you know, one of the things I think that he does really well is at least just um, highlighting something that a lot of people outside of the um, African diaspora, if you will, or outside of the African ascendant community may not even be aware of um, in terms of um, this very pervasive, uh, you know, pervasive stigmas, um, pervasive negative stigmas, and um, even discrimination on the basis of our natural hair textures and the and extent to which black women and girls go through and go to, to try to really um, either reduce or hopefully eliminate the kind of discrimination um, that we, we may experience. And we often experience in our personal spaces, professional spaces, educational spaces, and in broader society when we are wearing our natural hair texture. And in turn, having to conform to what I call a straight hair expectation um, or mandate, you know, in all of these different spheres. Um, so I think, and, and I think he does a really good job of being able to just kind of pull back, you know, the curtain on something that I think within our community, we are very much aware of and, and we, we know about, but we don't really talk about. Um, um, as it relates to it and started the conversation in terms of what Dr. Poe was talking about in terms of the kinds of, you know, the extent to which we will go to really conform to this straight hair um, expectation and pressure, right? Um, that we may subject ourselves and often subject ourselves to, um, you know, these chemical burns, um, excruciating chemical burns, hair loss, scalp damage. Um, and then in turn, of course, that, you know, if you're losing your hair, then there's that emotional and psychological damage that goes along with 
with is that trauma of that um, and also trying to repair that trauma, um, the kinds of, um, you know, the money and the time and the energy it takes to repair that yeah. trauma. Um, so I think he does a good job of opening up that conversation in addition to the economic um, burdens um, as well. You know, I was not aware because I had never not worn my own hair. <laughs> so um, um, until now with my, my, my faux locks. So this is a whole other thing. But so there's two parts to that. You know, um, you know, in terms of that. So I didn't know. I mean, I knew my first job. I'll go a little bit back a little bit. My first job um, when I was in high school was as a receptionist in a hair salon. So when I say my 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 interrogation of hair is deeply rooted, it really is. Um, no pun intended. And so I would see, you know, a lot of women, you know, getting, you know, the weaves and um, wearing wigs and all those other things. But I had never engaged in that. Um, and and um, until you know more recently, and it's only because, in in, in terms of the faux locks, it's because I, I was living in a hair desert, right? So there wasn't anyone who would be able to do my naturally, you know, my naturally curly hair, um, and I didn't trust anyone to be able to do it. So that's hence why I decided to go with um, a protective hairstyle, right? But it was my first time ever doing such in all my life. So I think there's that part of it too, in terms of, you know, he definitely illuminates, you know, a, a lot of these deliberations and decisions we have to make as it relates to our hair and how much our hair, um, you know, we revolve around our hair um, in, 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 in everyday life. Um, but one thing I will say is that I would have loved to see more about sort of the roots of this um, denigration and stigmatization of natural hair. Where was this bias? How did it originate? Um, um, I would have loved to have seen a little bit more historical um, context to that, and even possibly a little bit more of a global context to that, in, in light of the fact that he did take a global look at, um, you know, the, the the hair industry, I mean, in particular, as it related to uh, weaves, uh, right? So that's, you know, one of the things that I, you know, the two things, I guess, it's like, I just would have liked for a little bit more substance on that part um, in terms of, you know, you know, it didn't come out of just, you know, thin air in terms of why we're doing all of these things in order to conform to, you know, these Eurocentric norms um, and expectations as it relates to straight hair. Um, and I would have liked for him to dig a little bit deeper in, ter in terms of um, the, the, the longstanding nature of um, natural hair bias and stigmas and in placing it into a broader historical and possibly global context um, in light of, you know, the, the real important voice that he he does have and because ultimately I don't know I know there some people might have come away from it and, and, and reconsidered their you know their choices as it relates to their hair but I, I I'm still kind of left as to whether or not you know people still um, after watching it whether or not people will come away from it thinking that all hair is good hair um, or is it still sort of that perpetuation of the idea that straight hair is good hair um, and so that those are my only uh, critiques as it relates to the film. Well, thank you. Those are all great. You know, um, in the years that we've done this, one of the survey questions is asked about zip codes. And the very first year that we did it, we had the geography department to map out the zip codes in Jefferson County. 95% um, of the zip codes were represented in attendance for our series which meant we were reaching the whole county. And then there were people outside the county and even outside the country um, that were visiting, that attended our sessions. So I'm gonna, we've not had any shortage of comments this time. This first comment was, this film was so disturbing for me. I had no idea about weaves, the relaxing I knew about, but hoped it was decreasing in use. It made me so sad that the high school students didn't feel it was okay for them to have natural hair to be professional. I grew up in the 60s and natural hair was seen as beautiful, which it is. Um, and then another comment here, I looked up Chris Rock's wife and daughters and they have relaxed hair now. <laughs> okay, um, let's see here. One of the first women that does we stated black women want their hair to look natural. One of the men stated they wanted their women to look good so they were willing to pay the price. Who and when was it decided that black hair is not natural or women don't look good with black hair? All four of you are beautiful. That was such a nice comment. And I think Dr. Green hit on that um, earlier in her comments. Let's see here. 
Uh, there's a comment here. I've been to Chupapati in India and I've been seeing tonsuri and didn't know the hair got sold there. So they had witnessed the process but didn't realize that the hair was being sold uh, in this country. And this question has got to go to Dr. Poe. Chemically, what's different from the liquid sodium hydroxide shown in the lab and the cream sodium hydroxide used as a relaxer? That's got to come from a stylus. <laughs> Can I send that your way, Dr. Poe? Sure, sure. I, I will be able to, happy to conjecture what I think one of the differences is. The main ingredient is still the same. Probably the difference is the concentration or the actual amount of, this, of the uh, base that's being used. And so one thing I, I just want to say about acids and bases as a chemist. So the sodium hydroxide, the active ingredient that is in relaxers is a base. And the public already hears a lot about acids. You know that acids are dangerous. You know that they can burn you. You know, you know as soon as you get it on you, it starts to burning. Anyone who has had a little bit of vinegar, which is a, a very weak acid, got a little bit of vinegar on them, you, you st it starts burning immediately. So, and we know, acids are dangerous and we try to stay clear of them and be very careful if we have to use them. But we don't talk about those same dangerous and safety concerns when it comes to a base. Sodium hydroxide is a very strong base and it causes burns just like acids. And I would say that the base is worse because as soon as you get an acid on you, you feel it, you feel the burn, you know something is happening to you. Not so with the base. You get the base on you, you don't know that it is causing damage immediately. It's causing the same damage, but you just can't feel it. So I think that's probably one of the reasons that it is the wonderful chemical to be used to relax your hair. Because as soon as as soon as the base is put into your hair, it starts breaking the hair down. I, I kind of want to give a, oh, I had this, uh, prepared. Well, you know what, I can just tell it now. So uh, I think I've answered the question for mm -hmm. the person, to, but I, I want to give a little bit more in terms of what the sodium hydroxide kind of actually does to our hair. So I got a slinky. <laughs> so I don't know if any, if people remember this slinky as part of a childhood toy, but yes. Yeah, so we can think of curly hair as being like a slinky. Some people have really, really curly hair. It's tight like a slinky and some folks will have kind of larger curls. So you see these blue things that are kind of uh, connected to each one of these curls. So we can call, so I'll call them bonds. So when you have really curly hair, these bonds then help to stabilize the hair and to keep the curl in a certain uh, a, a certain curl, a certain uh, tightness or either looseness of the curl. And so what sodium hydroxide does, it, it actually breaks these bonds. So it breaks these bonds. And when you can, your curl pattern, you could have two, I've only, I'm only showing two between the curl. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't even say that this is representative of a hair strand, one curly hair strand. And I'm only showing like two bonds here, but depending upon your curl pattern, you can have two to five of them connecting between each one of these uh, top curl here to the bottom one and kind of strengthening the hair and keeping the curl pattern, you know, kind of curly. So what the sodium hydroxide does is it comes in and it breaks these bonds and then it allows the hair to be straight just you know all the way straightened out and there are no more bonds between any of the hair follicles so the hair can be totally straightened out i can't even do it with the slinky but but okay so it straightens the hair because it breaks the bonds that her, holds the curl pattern together but then it also weakens the hair because our hair is made of proteins and sodium hydroxide breaks apart proteins so if anyone who has had relaxed hair and they're wearing it naturally now, they say that my relaxed hair was weaker, the color tree, it was weaker, you know, it would break more easily. It's because the sodium hydroxide weakened the hair and it's not as healthy as the natural hair. 
And, and what happens is water tries to put those bonds back together. Uh, uh, yeah, water tries to put those bonds back together. And also when the sodium hydroxide breaks those bonds, it's permanent. The hair, the hair just stays straight. And the only time the hair becomes curly again is when it's growing out of your head. So a lot of times people have the curl, their, their natural genetically, you know, uh, genetically directed curl pattern coming out of their hair. And then they'll have this straight hair, which has been the relaxed hair, the permanently relaxed hair that, that will never get the curl pattern again. So I, I just kind of wanted to show that illustration and kind of show you actually what sodium hydroxide is doing to the hair, to, to the hair follicles. Thank you. That's what we needed you for. <laughs> Hey, hey. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to bring up uh, when researching this too was the fact that our FDA doesn't really um, monitor the chemicals mm -hmm. that go into black hair products. And so a lot of the chemicals in our black hair products are banned in Europe and outside the United States that do monitor the cosmetics and the hair products in their countries. So mm -hmm. we're using things that have been known to cause cancer we're using things that have been known to have long-term effects. Um, let me go to some of the more comments here. Most of my adult life, I've rejected the big beauty cosmetic industry by whatever name, which keeps telling us that we need fixing, something is not right. And so no matter how we try, we're never finished. There's always something more we need to buy for our bodies in addition to clothing. Mm. Um, there's another comment, is this worth the trade? Well. In 2009, it was a $9 billion trade investment in black hair products aimed toward African-Americans. Um, people are making money. Uh, I suspect Chris Rock is trying to show this as brainwashing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you don't necessarily see what's done with the chemicals. I've had a relaxer for over 30 years. My hair was beautiful. It wasn't until I mishandled those chemicals that I started to see the problem. And here's a comment. Does some of the blame credit go to celebrities as models? I'm gonna direct that one to Dr. Cunningham because I had a question for her that I was interested in. Um, what messages can we use to reinforce positive images in black women and children? Because obviously this comment is talking about celebrities as models making this impression that to be beautiful, you have to have this European lens of straight hair. What can we do to make people feel better? Yeah, well, those are kind of two, the, the comment was kind of one question and I'll answer your question too, Dr. Krieger. Um, but the first question of, you know, who is to blame for this? And I think Dr. Green kind of spoke to this. I wish I could name, you know, just one or a handful of people and places and systems. But like I said earlier, it's so deeply rooted. Um, and we get the messages from a lot of places, not just media, not just the beauty industry. Um, like I mentioned, we get them from family, we get them from people around us as well. Um, and the ways in which that has been socialized and happens has happened over time goes back to a lot, a lot of history, which Dr. Green might actually be able to speak um, a lot too. Um, so to, I say all of that to say there are a lot of places and contexts and systems that are um, attributed to the messages that we receive. Um, and to your point, Dr. Krieger, just as much as we receive messages, um, we can also counteract messages, right? And so um, I think a lot of, you know, the, the transformation kind of comes at really understanding what does good mean? Um, and do we even need that association um, with our hair or with anything uh, for that matter? Um, when I think about myself, I, I have a young daughter. She's actually, uh, you know, one, almost one and a half years old. Um, and before I became a mother, I thought a lot about myself of, I remember maybe five, 10 years ago, um, thinking to myself, actually maybe 10 years ago, because it was probably right around the time this film actually was released. I remember thinking I was relaxed at the the time. And I remember thinking to myself, 
when I have children, I do not want to relax their hair. I was definitely one of those folks who love my mom. She's probably going to be upset at me for saying this, um, but she slapped a perm on my head when I was a little kid. I can't even remember. I don't have a first memory of the relaxer because I was so young. Um, and so for me, that was, it was habitual. It was what I knew. It was how I was raised. Um, straighten your hair. I think on one end, um, you know, the, the, like the need or the, the kind of, um, yearning to straighten one's hair is to reflect a certain beauty standard, kind of like what Dr. Green said. But on the other hand, parents sometimes feel like it is harder to manage natural hair. And I will say, as someone who's become natural, it can be a bit difficult. Um, so when I was younger and I was thinking to myself, I don't want to do this to my children, um, I said, well, I, I'm not a person that likes to preach what I don't actually act and do, right? So I got to a point where I was like, you know, um, if I want to raise natural hair children, Children. I probably need to understand natural hair and I probably need to be natural myself, right? I have a whole lot of reasons and ways of how I got to become natural, which I won't go into all of that detail. Um, but I will say in my process of allowing myself to express the natural hair that comes out of my head, um, I did have to myself kind of um, kind of confront some of my own internalized kind of issues with hair. Um, and I think one really can't transform or kind of change the messages without make having that in, in a personal kind of deep um, con confrontation themselves. And so I think at some point you have to ask yourself, where did these messages come from? Why did they come? Um, and how have they impacted me? Um, and how do I want to change the messaging for those who I love, be that my children, be that my family, my friends, my peers. Um, and, and sometimes, like I said, it's looking at what does good really mean? I tell my daughter and I tell my nieces and other people in my life that good hair is hair that is loved and cared for you love on and you care for your hair, that is that is what's goodness, right? And so I think we do have to transform those messages um, and be very aware of the fact that anything you say or do, or even some of the things you don't say um, can be kind of received by folks and perceived by folks, right? And so you have to be very careful making comments like, oh, so-and-so has good hair or so-and-so has bad hair. Um, when it's, you know, your children or your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, um, you have to be aware of the power of your words um, and make sure they're being used to uplift and not necessarily, you know, make comments that could hurt people. So I think there's a lot of things that, that can influence kind of how we, how we kind of change that messaging. Thank you for that. And I have to do a shout out to your aunt Felicia, who just sent me a message on the chat that she belongs to you. She was one of my residents a long, long time ago. Yes. This question is going to go to Dr. Green. They wanted to know who started the natural Afro trend of the 70s and 80s, Black Panthers, Angela Davis, what happened to that? I think what happened to that, having lived through that era and had hair like Angela Davis during that time, professional expectations and trying to assimilate may have changed that. Can you tell us some of your experiences and discrimination and employment because of hair? Sure. So the first question about when did it happen or why did it happen? Um, you know, I think there. Are, I, I think to your point, I, it definitely you started to see, um, and, and there's been a back and forth. You know, even starting in terms of, um, you know, in terms of like celebrating, you know, straight hair or communicating that straight hair was going to lead to greater um, opportunities, whether it be professional or educational or even dating and marriage. You know, those personal opportunities and relationships. Um, um, how you're going to be received in society. That started, um, you know, when we came to this country, honestly. Um, but, you know, it definitely, we start to see more of that in terms of advertisements um, as it relates to communicating if you have straight hair that it can lead to greater opportunities in personal and professional and educational spaces and social spaces, just more broadly. Um, definitely during the eras of racial slavery towards like reconstruction after reconstruction or what I call the era of a man, Participation. 
And so you see all of these advertisements in terms of, you know, tonics that you can use um, to straighten your hair. And if you and if you and if you do straighten your hair, then this is going to be something that your husband is going to like or um, you'll have a greater opportunity to, to get a husband, to find a man, all these types of things, even starting in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And it and it continued. Right. If you look at a lot of these advertisements um, by, um, you know, um, those who were selling um, straightening products, right, whether it be a relaxer or some other type of, um, you know, what I call hair technology or, or a beauty product. Um, in the 19, you know, late, mid to late, mid to late um, 1970s, early 80s, we see it again, you know, even though in the midst of, you know, this Black Pride movement, um, you know, Black is Beautiful movement, um, that there is this, you know, this overwhelming sort of like conservative conservatism that is happening politically and socially that I think definitely we embraced as a community and you start to see more people, um, you know, not no longer rocking their their froze and their braids and things of that nature and going towards um, straightened hairstyles as well as the 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 jerry curls. So <laughs> if you guys remember <laughs> all these things, right, to sort of loosen our curl pattern. Um, and not really recognizing that those things weren't good for us. I won't even get into all of that. But I remember even during that time frame, I was a kid and I was begging my parents because everybody in my family, except for my, my dad and my mom, they had you know, jerry curls. I was like, please, please, please let me get a jerry curl. I'm so glad she said no, but <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, so fast forward in terms of discrimination, um, or this, the the need to, the the assimilation, you know, we started to see it definitely, you know, pick up during the '80s, '90s, and we're just really starting to see within like the past ten years, as you know, Dr. Cunningham um, alluded to, um, you know, this 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 celebration, this renewed celebration and um, embrace of natural hair textures and protective hairstyles. I think for a variety of reasons, um, you know, health related reasons, um, economic reasons. Um, personal reasons or combination of all of the above, right? So everybody's reason as to why they do it is very different. In terms of discrimination, one of the things that the film definitely does illuminate is that, you know, that fear of discrimination is real and the reality of the discrimination is real. Um, um, and unfortunately, those children are already starting to understand that, um, you know, that they, in order to possibly be sort of like free from additional forms of race discrimination, um, that you may have to straighten your hair doesn't mean that you're going to be free from racial discrimination, but straightened hairstyles at least may eliminate, um, you know, that kind of discrimination or stigmatization in the workplace. And unfortunately, you know, just last year, late last year, we had a study out of Duke, you know, that just reaffirms um, that, you know, Black women in particular who who rock natural hairstyles are less likely, even though they may be qualified and competent, are less likely to, to get job, job interviews than say black women who wear straight hair, white women who have straight hair and white women, and, and white women who have curly hair, right? So that barrier to that, just the initial barrier to our employment opportunities as it relates to our hairstyles is absolutely very real, whether it's a conscious or unconscious thing. Um, and then in the workplace too, you have stories about women where, um, you know, for example, in a, in, a, in, a, in a case involving a black woman who wore a natural hairstyle and a petition was sent around her office uh, where her colleagues actually signed the petition um, because they believed or perceived her natural hairstyles as being unprofessional, right? So that kind of harassment and hostile work environment um, actually, per, you know, it, it persists. And unfortunately, the court didn't find it <laughs> to be a hostile work environment at all, you know, having this, um, this, this petition being circulated. Um, additionally, you have individuals who are discriminated against on the basis of their natural hairstyles, not just because they say, you know, expressly no natural hairstyles, but oftentimes we see these employment policies that are race neutral, like, you know, banning unprofessional hairstyles or extreme hairstyles or unusual hairstyles. And then they are basically enforced against um, Black women and men um, who are wearing natural hairstyles to effectively result in what I call natural hair bans, right? Um, because they're perceived as unprofessional or unattractive or unusual. And, um, and, 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 
ultimately um, ends up resulting in what I call the hyper-regulation of Black people's bodies via our hair. Because we're told often, especially Black women, how we should and should not wear our hair all the time. You know, there have been supervisors who will tell uh, Black women, you know, I want your hair in a pretty hairstyle. And, and then when, she, for example, she changes her natural hairstyles into what she considers to be a pretty hairstyle, like from, say, braids to twists, twists to locks. Um, what has happened in another case is that that supervisor then imposes a, um, a, a grooming policy that basically bars her from wearing those natural hairstyles, right? And basically trying to coerce her or compel her to, to wear straighten hair, whether it be through wigs, weaves, or chemical products or extreme heat styling, right? So these are the kinds of things that are happening every single day in our workplaces. Um, and why I've advanced that this is a form of race discrimination and obviously is a form of race discrimination at the intersection of gender as well as color, which is talked about in the movie movie, as well as class, um, and even religion, um, that, you know, frankly, our um, policies in our workplaces and educational spaces needs to attend to, and then ultimately, hopefully, um, you know, our laws as well will attend to. Thank you, Professor Green. Um, this has gotten to be an emotional discussion, and I was afraid it might happen. So what I am going to do is show something that I hope will make everybody in the audience and all our panels feel a lot better about what's happening. We're gonna view Hair Love. It was awarded the Academy Award for Best Short Film Animated Division in 2020. It was uh, produced by Matthew Cherry and it tells the heartfelt story of an African-American father learning to do his, his daughter's hair for the first time. The project was a collaboration with Sony Pictures Animation that launched a Kickstarter campaign in 2017 with a fundraising goal of 75,000. Strong support led to the campaigns amassing nearly 300,000, making it the most highly funded short film campaign in Kickstarter history. The picture book, Hair Love, was released uh, on May 14th, 2019, and it became a New York Times bestseller. And our free public library in Louisville has copies of the book, Free Love, and I'm going to ask um, our library to put that film on for us so that we can view it. Thank you so much, Paul, for showing that. That was a last minute addition. I would very much like to thank our panelists and thank you, our audience. We didn't get to all your questions and comments, but thank you so much for sending them in. Next week, February the 28th, we'll be screening the film Detroit. This is a fact-based drama set during the 1967 Detroit riots in which a group of rogue police officers respond to a complaint with retribution rather than justice on their minds. This film is rated R. It lasts two hours and 23 minutes. At a two o'clock film start, the panel will begin at 4.30 and the event will end at 5.30. If you've not registered, Registration closes at 4 p.m. Friday. Um, the date on that should be on the 26th. Please note that if we run out of virtual seats before then, then it closes early because there are limited spaces available. Um, I hope you're able to see the film through the uh, streaming services at the library. You can register through the Louisville Free Public Library website. It's https colon backslash backslash www.lfpl.org backslash AAH, that's African American History Films. Or you can call 502-574-1623 uh, to register by phone. The library is closed to the general public, but you can make appointments to use the computers in the libraries in the Louisville area. You have to call and make an appointment and a reservation for the computers. They will help you establish an email address if you need to do that. And you can make sure that you can register for the film series and see the film. I hope you can join us next Sunday, the 28th on the uh, film Detroit. And again, thank you so very much to our panelists and thank you so very much for Louisville viewing our African-American History Film Series 2021 on our video platform. Everybody be safe out there and we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.